This is Lecture 4 of the series Wealth, Natural Resources, and the Environment, and the Political Concept of Monopoly. Well, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this morning I want to complete my elaboration of the connections between socialism and environmentalism and uh, go on to the elaboration of the connections between environmentalism and irrationalism. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask you uh, to keep in mind uh, in my discussion of the connections between socialism and environmentalism those uh, horrendous quotations from Graeber and McKibben and others perhaps that you may have seen of the same kind and uh, even more importantly the logical demonstration of why uh, hatred for man and his works uh, follows necessarily from the premise of the whole environmental movement that nature possesses intrinsic value. So please keep those uh, points in mind. Well, I'll begin by expanding on the second paragraph on page 20 of the Toxicity of Environmentalism to wit, part of this will be simply a, a repetition, but then there'll be new material. The only difference I can see between the green movement of the environmentalists and the red movement of the communists and socialists is the superficial one of the specific reasons for which they want to violate individual liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The reds claimed that the individual could not be left free because the result would be such things as exploitation, monopoly, and depressions. The Greens claim that the individual cannot be left free because the result will be such things as destruction of the ozone layer, acid rain, and global warming. Both claim that centralized government control over economic activity is essential. The Reds wanted it for the alleged sake of achieving human prosperity. <clears throat> The Greens want it for the alleged sake of avoiding environmental damage and for the actual admitted purpose of inflicting human misery and death, which was also the actual but unadmitted purpose for which the Reds wanted it. Both the Reds and the Greens want someone to suffer and die. The one, the capitalists and the rich, for the alleged sake of the wage earners and the poor. The other, a major portion of all mankind, for the alleged sake of the lower animals and inanimate nature. Thus, it should not be surprising to see hordes of former Reds or of those who otherwise would have become Reds turning from Marxism and becoming the Greens of the ecology movement. It is the same fundamental philosophy in a different guise ready as ever to wage war on the freedom and well-being of the individual. In seeking to destroy capitalism and industrial civilization, both movements provide ample potential opportunity for those depraved individuals who would rather kill than live, who would rather inflict pain and death than experience pleasure, whose pleasure comes from the infliction of pain and death. Unfortunately, there is no lack of such individuals. There are serial murderers in the world. History tells us of mobs that cheered at the sight of human beings being torn to pieces by wild beasts in the arena, and of other mobs that cheered at the sight of witches and heretics burning alive at the stake. In our own time, there have been Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, and an army and an array of lesser such gangsters, each with a whole army of sadistic murderers at his beck and call. In most cases, there has been some kind of philosophical justification for the murders, such as the will of God, the achievement of Lebensraum, or the establishment of communism and a future classless society. Each of these alleged values supposedly justified the murder of living human beings. As the communists were so fond of saying, the end justifies the means. And now there are the leaders of the ecology movement whose alleged end is the preservation of such things as wildlife, jungles, and rock formations for their own sake, and for whose alleged sake they look forward to throttling and destroying industrial civilization 
and decimating mankind. Whatever may have been the delusions of religious fanatics and the advocates of racial or class warfare concerning the actual nature of their values, such delusions must wear exceedingly thin in the case of the environmental movement. It is transparently obvious that no one in the world can actually value such things as rock formations, jungles, and dangerous wildlife for their own sake. At best, that would be comparable to valuing pebbles on Mars or gas clouds on Jupiter for their own sake. But what some people can value, unfortunately, <coughs> is the sight of other human beings suffering. This was the value which the communists and the Nazis sought, which religious fanatics have sought, which serial murderers seek, and which the leaders of the environmental movement seek. The kind of potential murderers that are to be found in the ranks of the environmental movement are, for the most part, probably not personally violent in any apparent way. In eras that are philosophically and culturally better than our own, they might even pass their entire lives quietly, in modest obscurity, causing harm to no one. In such an era, Hitler might have passed his days as an obscure paper hanger, Himmler as a chicken farmer, and Eichmann as a factory worker or office clerk. Lenin would probably have been just a disgruntled intellectual, and Stalin perhaps an obscure cleric. But in the conditions of a collapse of rationality, frustrations and feelings of hatred and hostility rapidly multiply, while cool judgment, rational standards, and civilized behavior vanish. Monstrous ideologies appear, and monsters in human form emerge alongside them, ready to put them into practice. The ecology movement is just such a movement with just such a potential. Its expressions of approval for such images as that of a terrified human being being eaten alive by alligators is an invitation to torturers and murderers looking for a rationale to call for the exercise of their bloodlust. In my view, the open irrationalism of environmentalism and ecology marks them as nothing but the intellectual death rattle of socialism in the West, the final convulsion of a movement that only a few decades ago looked forward to the results of paralyzing the actions of individuals by means of social engineering and now seeks to paralyze the actions of individuals <clears throat> by means of prohibiting engineering of any kind. If such comparisons are possible, as I've said, I think the greens are a cut below the reds, and I also think they will fade much more quickly from the scene because of their open irrationality. However justified today's intellectual mainstream is in doubting its mind and hating itself, it has absolutely no basis for blaming its self-doubt and self-hatred on reason. What it took as reason in advocating socialism was never reason, but contemptible ignorance, which it apparently takes, what it apparently takes as having been loyalty to reason in its adherence to socialism was never loyalty to reason, but willful defiant ignorance. The roots of the intellectual's abandonment of reason are to be found not in the collapse of socialism, but in their previous support of socialism. In the days of a generation or more ago, when the intellectual mainstream still projected confidence in reason, what it took reason to mean in the realm of politics and economics was that a comparative handful of men, an intellectual elite, would arrogate to themselves a monopoly of thought. They would deny the rationality and the independence of the great mass of mankind and treat everyone as clay for them to mold. Everyone would be compelled to live his life in compliance with their central plan. This was the meaning of socialism and its social engineering. Naturally, this project failed miserably. Its failure was certainly not the failure of reason, however. On the contrary, it was the failure of a monumentally irrational idea. 
namely that the, independent of e the, that the independent exercise of reason by the great mass of mankind could be prohibited in the economic realm, and that somehow on the strength of a tiny insignificant fraction of mankind's collective intelligence, economic success could be achieved for all. Whatever sort of, quote, fatal conceit, unquote, this may have been, to use the expression of Professor Hayek, it was certainly not any conceit of reason. At its base, the entire project was marked by the most profound contempt for reason, for the reason of all mankind but that of the intellectual elite, which was to rule mankind under socialism. Today, the intellectuals apparently think they have learned their lesson. <clears throat> they are through with engineering, all of engineering, and through with reason, because they think they know how badly the seemingly best laid rational plans can run amok. They now believe <clears throat> that man's acting on nature, on a foundation of reason and science, is as dangerous as their acting on man, on a foundation of, quote, reason and quote, science. On what, in a state of virtual dementia, they, cho they choose to believe is reason and science, namely Marxism and other variants of collectivism. Thus, for example, they believe that the engineering of atomic power plants and dams is as dangerous as the engineering of people that they so long supported in countries such as the Soviet Union. This is how they act. This is how their behavior can be understood. The lesson the intellectuals should have learned from the failure of socialism and still could learn if they finally choose to end their ignorance and read the authors I mentioned in my last lecture, above all Ayn Rand and Ludwig von Mises, is the pre precise opposite of the one they claim to have learned. The correct lesson is that it is human reason that one must respect, namely the reason of the individual human being. The substantive meaning of this proposition is that one must respect individual rights, as understood by John Locke and the founding fathers of the United States, and that the social system which one must uphold as representing the consistent implementation of respect for individual rights is laissez-faire capitalism. If the intellectuals understood this lesson, then they would understand that what it is dangerous to violate is laissez-faire in the realm of human beings. The obvious fact is, of course, that man can successfully control nature for the benefit of his life. But the essential politico-economic requirement of his doing so is that the government must not attempt to control man. The individual man or woman is the possessor of reason and the being of ultimate value, each to him or herself, whose rights must be fully respected. It is these individually sovereign beings who must be free to act upon nature. When they are free, they form and intensify associations that constitute a division of labor society. They create capitalism. They are then capable of acting upon nature with all of the progressively growing success demonstrated in the Western world over the last two centuries or more. However, because today's intellectual mainstream does not fundamentally distinguish man from inanimate nature, on such explicitly philosophical grounds as determinism, the inference today's intellectuals have apparently drawn from the failure of socialism is the lunatic notion that it is dangerous to violate laissez-faire in the realm of nature. Instead of arriving at the insights of the British classical economists into the natural economic harmonies prevailing among free, rational beings and requiring the absence of government intervention, they believe they have gained insights into alleged natural harmonies prevailing among wild animals and inanimate objects. They call these alleged harmonies ecosystems, and they believe that the existence of ecosystems requires the absence of intervention by rational human beings in nature. 
in a manner reminiscent of economists arguing against government intervention into the affairs of human beings, they argue against human interference with nature and its alleged ecosystems. Ironically, in arguing in this way, the ecology movement not only seeks the perpetuation of all of the horrors of socialism by virtue of paralyzing the actions of individuals, but also turns out to embody the substance of what was once an unjust caricature of the defenders of capitalism. For it adopts, for it adopts as its actual policy what its intellectual predecessors ridiculed the defenders of capitalism for supposedly believing, namely that man should not intervene in nature for fear of unleashing unknown forces. That was what the advocates of socialism and government intervention repeatedly accused the defenders of capitalism of believing when the latter stood on the grounds of economic law and its harmonies as an argument against government interference in the economic system. In taking this position, the advocates of capitalism, of course, never advocated, as the leftists chronically claimed, a policy of do nothing. On the contrary, they have always advocated that the government do nothing so that the individual citizens could be free to do what was necessary to achieve their prosperity. The defenders of capitalism argue both against government interference into the affairs of men and in favor of human interference in nature. The two are merely different sides of the same coin. Namely, individuals must be free of government intervention precisely in order for them to be able effectively to intervene in nature. It is the individual citizens, not the government, who are the controllers of nature. Whether the government prohibits its citizens from acting on nature on the grounds that it must have a monopoly of such activity or on the grounds that such activity is simply dangerous, the substance and the consequences are identical, namely paralysis, poverty, and death. The socialists at least kept up the pretense that they wanted to achieve human values more efficiently than free individuals could. The environmentalists make clear that their actual purpose in alleging the harmonies of ecosystems and arguing against human intervention in nature is the destruction of human values. In the ecology movement, the left has reduced itself to a mass of terrified ignoramuses, fearful of newfangled technology. It reveals itself as a virtual ma and pa kettle of the intellect. <coughs> a remnant from the dark ages, having managed to survive all this time on some kind of intellectual wildlife preserve, to borrow an expression of Ayn Rand's. What incredible irony it is that even as this is what the left has become, its members continue to have the audacity to criticize the advocacy of capitalism and economic freedom as reactionary. The more consistent members of the ecology movement openly urge a return to the Pleistocene, to the Stone Age, in order to live in an alleged harmony with nature. Yet at the very same time, in the political arena, advocates of some measure of freedom and capitalism, who espouse recognizable elements of the social philosophy formed in the 18th century, in the age of reason, and found in the United States Constitution, are ridiculed as dinosaur Republicans because they presumably wish to return to the age of reason. <laughs> it is high time this travesty ended. Its foundation was the Marxist doctrine that socialism was the politico-economic system called for by human reason and thus that movement toward it represented an improvement in human conditions and moreover, that mankind was impelled toward progress by automatic historical forces. All of these notions, of course, are totally false and are now discredited in the eyes of the world. Socialism is a vicious, destructive system. 
movement towards socialism is movement toward tyranny, poverty, and death. On the other hand, capitalism is the politico-economic system actually called for by human reason. Its rising production and improving standards of living represent economic progress. Movement toward capitalism or toward a more consistent form of capitalism is what actually represents progress in the political realm. And of course, neither movement toward capitalism nor toward socialism, that is, neither progress nor decline, is inevitable. Each depends on the influence of ideas. Progress on the influence of rational ideas, decline on the influence of irrational ideas. In the environmental movement, the left now clearly reveals itself to be the most reactionary movement in the history of the world, a movement whose moderates <laughs> seek a return to the economic conditions of a century ago and whose logically consistent elements openly seek a return to the economic conditions of the Middle Ages or indeed of the Stone Age. If ever there was a group of people who, in the words of a well-known liberal of the last generation, needed to be dragged, kicking and screaming, into the 20th century, into the modern world, it is today's left, the greens of the ecology movement. <clears throat> the transformation of the socialist movement into the ecology movement creates the opportunity for the defenders of capitalism to reclaim their rightful place as the true representatives of science, progress, and enlightenment and to make sure that wherever intelligent people who value reason are found, they will increasingly enroll under the banners of capitalism. Furthermore, the advocates of capitalism should now proudly proclaim that they turn to the thinkers of earlier centuries of the modern era for inspiration, to thinkers such as Adam Smith and John Locke, rather than to, to most of today's intellectuals. Thanks to the left's transformation into the ecology movement, they can now claim with obvious justification the same kind of modernity in doing so that men of the Renaissance could claim in looking to thinkers of antiquity for inspiration rather than to their ignorant contemporaries. Thus, it can readily be conceded that Adam Smith and John Locke and the founding fathers of the United States rode in horse-drawn carriages and wore powdered wigs, and that the contemporary intellectuals of today fly in jet planes and wear the fashions of today. But those men were the source of essential ideas on which the Industrial Revolution and our present level of technological and economic development rest. When they rode in horse-drawn carriages, they were thinking the thoughts that made possible the jet planes of today. Today's intellectuals, although they fly in jet planes, are thinking thoughts which are incompatible with the continuation of industrial civilization. This is now blatantly obvious in their support of ecology and in their growing denunciations of economic progress and in their transparent efforts to stifle and undo it. They should certainly not be credited with any of the technological achievements of the age in which they live and which they are in fact out to destroy and then on the basis of such error be regarded in any way as more advanced or superior to the thinkers of earlier centuries whose, uh, whose accomplishments made possible the accomplishments of our own. The nature of their souls, those of the contemporary intellectuals, and the intellectual level of their philosophy are well expressed in the call back to the Pleistocene, a call which if they do not make themselves they are certainly not at pains to dispute or capable of disputing. In other words, contemporary intellectuals, with few exceptions, are not at all modern or advanced, but backward and primitive, far, far behind intellectuals of earlier generations whom they delight in ridiculing. The future course of civilization hinges on the extent to which the advocates of capital and reason can take the intellectual offensive against an opposition that is now nothing more than a rapidly decomposing intellectual corpse. Their ultimate victory appears to be assured, provided only that they keep their philosophy alive by studying it and teaching it to a widening circle of others.
My elaboration of the connections between environmentalism and irrationalism, to which I'm now about to turn, will fall under three headings. <clears throat> Irrational skepticism, the destructive role of contemporary education, and the cultural devaluation of men. A major foundation of the environmentalist irrationalism that is of long standing is the conviction that whatever we may think we know today about anything can turn out to be wrong tomorrow because of the discovery of something new which totally invalidates all our, of our presumed knowledge about it. This doctrine, which is now increasingly popular, has been a virtual stock in trade of philosophy courses and of higher education in general for several generations. It is on this premise that the ecologists believe and project that every technological advance is a potential thalidomide, having who knows what potential destructive consequences. Thalidomide, of course, was the drug that was prescribed as a tranquilizer for pregnant women and that turned out to cause major damage to fetuses. <clears throat> All of their wild conjectures about hidden dangers and mass destruction are reinforced by this premise of which they are already convinced in advance of and apart from the facts of any particular case. As Dr. Peacock has shown, <clears throat> such skepticism rests on ignorance of the science of epistemology and on the fallacy of equivocation. It does not understand how man achieves knowledge, how he validates his conclusions, and can therefore be rationally confident of them. It assumes, in effect, that all claims to knowledge are equal, the proved and the unproved, and that because, some claims turn, uh, that because some claims to knowledge turn out to be false, any claim to knowledge can turn out to be false. For example, it claims that the very fact that people ardently believed in Ptolemaic astronomy at one time and were later proved wrong by Copernicus and Galileo itself raises the possibility that Copernican and Galilean astronomy will someday be proved wrong. The truth is, of course, that knowledge is knowledge and continues to be knowledge for all time to come. It is not overthrown by later discoveries, but is supplemented and, ad and expanded by them. The physics of Archimedes was not <clears throat> overthrown, but expanded by the physics of Newton. The geometry of Euclid is as true today as ever, though we now know much more about mathematics than Euclid did. The truths in the writings of Adam Smith are as true today as when he first wrote them, though our knowledge of economics has been greatly expanded by Ricardo, the Mills, Bombavert, von Mises, and others. All of technological and economic progress is a confirmation of the fact that the discoveries of later generations add to the discoveries of previous ones rather than refute them. If new discoveries constantly refuted previous discoveries, as the skeptics claim, progress of any kind would simply be impossible. Progress rests on the fact that knowledge is a growing sum with the in which the contributions of succeeding generations are added to those of previous generations. Similar reasoning applies to the possibility of accidents, which the ecologists fear so greatly. Despite man's best efforts, accidents sometimes occur. A dam may burst, a building may collapse, a drug may turn out to be unsafe. But by the nature of the case, accidents are the exception, a departure from normal. Moreover, they steadily tend to be reduced in frequency and severity as man's knowledge and prosperity grow. Indeed, each accident, if its causes are studied and analyzed, itself tends to prevent a repetition of that accident. Thus, the actual record of man, when he chooses to use his reason, is a steady increase in safety. Few things could be more obvious than that the food, drugs, dams, buildings, bridges, ships, trains, and factories of the 20th century are incomparably safer than those of the 19th century. Apart from, growing, from the influence of growing irrationality, progress in safety has continued decade by decade in the 20th century. I turn now <clears throat> to an elaboration on the destructive role of contemporary education in the rise of environmentalism, which I will show goes far beyond the content of modern liberal arts education that I described in my pamphlet.
It is sometimes observed that most of today's high school and college graduates have very little actual education in science and mathematics, and thus do not understand and cannot properly appreciate modern technology. There is considerable merit in these observations, but the problem goes much deeper. Namely, from the earliest grades, the prevailing methodology of contemporary education systematically encourages the irrational skepticism I described a few moments ago. To explain how this is the case, I must digress briefly into the history of philosophy. As you all know, at the end of the 18th century, Immanuel Kant foisted on the intellectual world a distorted version of what reason is both in reaction against the Kantian version of reason and on the direct foundation of it, as early as the first quarter of the 19th century, reason was being popularly denounced by intellectuals of the Romantic era as a, quote, false secondary power by which we multiply distinctions, unquote. The Romantic's reaction against the Kantian version of reason can be understood in exactly the same way as Ayn Rand has described the later reaction of the existentialists against it. Namely, quote, if this is reason, to hell with it, <clears throat> unquote. Romanticism, however, also follows on the direct foundation of Kantianism, which holds that man's mind is incapable of actually knowing reality, and thus that, quote, to attain a knowledge of the real, we must go out of consciousness, unquote. According to W.T. Jones, a leading historian of philosophy, quote, to the romantic mind, the distinctions that reason makes are artificial, imposed, and man-made. They divide, and in dividing, destroy the living whole of reality. We murder to dissect. How then are we to get in touch with the real? This is still continuing the quote. By divesting ourselves insofar as we can, of the whole apparatus of learning and scholarship, and by becoming like children or simple, uneducated men, by attending to nature rather than to the works of man, by becoming passive and letting nature work upon us, by contemplation and communion rather than by ratiocination and scientific method." Unquote. The Romantics, writes Jones, held that, quote, we are nearer to the truth about the universe when we dream than when we are awake, and, quote, nearer to it as children than as adults, unquote. A clear implication of the philosophy of Romanticism is that the valuable, creative portion of our mental life has no essential connection with our ability to reason and with the deliberate, controlled use of our conscious mind. We allegedly possess it in our sleep and as children, <clears throat> the valuable creative portion of our minds. In its essentials, the philosophy of Romanticism is the guiding principle of contemporary education. Exactly like Romanticism, contemporary education holds that the valuable creative portion of our mental life has no essential connection with our ability to reason and with the deliberate controlled use of our conscious mind. That we possess this portion of our mental life, if not in our sleep, then nevertheless as small children. This doctrine is clearly present in the avowed conviction, a conviction of contemporary education that creativity is a phenomenon that is separate from and independent of such conscious mental processes as memorization and the use of logic. Indeed, it is an almost universally accepted proposition of contemporary pseudoscience that one half of the human brain is responsible for such conscious processes as the use of logic, while the other half is responsible for creativity, as though when examined, the halves of the brain revealed this information all by themselves by bearing labels marked logic unit made in Hong Kong and creativity <laughs> respectively. Obviously, the view of the brain as functioning in this way is a conclusion which is based on the philosophy and thus the interpretive framework of the doctrine's supporters. Now, properly, education is a process 
by means of which students internalize knowledge. They mentally absorb it through observation and proof and repeated application. Memorization, deduction, and problem solving must constantly be involved. The purpose is to develop the student's mind, to provide him with an instantaneously available storehouse of knowledge inside his brain, and thus an increasingly powerful mental apparatus that he will be able to use and further expand throughout his life. Such education, of course, requires hard work from the student. <clears throat> Seen from a physiological perspective, it may be that what the process of education requires of the student through his exercises is some form of actual imprinting of his brain. Yet, <clears throat> under the influence of the philosophy of Romanticism, contemporary edu education is fundamentally opposed to these essentials of education. It draws a distinction between problem solving, which it views as creative and claims to favor, and memorization, which it appears to regard as an imposition on the students <coughs> uh, whose valuable executive level time, it claims, can be better spent in problem solving. Contemporary education thus proceeds on the assumption that the ability to solve problems is innate, or at least fully developed before the child begins school. It perceives its job as allowing the student to exercise his native problem-solving abilities while imposing on him as little as possible of the allegedly unnecessary and distracting task of memorization. In the elementary grades, this approach is expressed in such attitudes as that it is not really necessary for students to go to the trouble of memorizing the multiplication tables if the availability of pocket calculators can be taken for granted, which they know how to use, or to go to the trouble of memorizing facts of history and geography if the ready availability of books and atlases containing the facts can be taken for granted, which facts the students know how to look up when the need for, for them arises. In college and graduate courses, this approach is expressed in the phenomenon of the open book examination, in which satisfactory performance is supposedly demonstrated by the ability to use a book as a source of information, proving once again that the student knows how to find the information when he or she needs it. With little exaggeration, <clears throat> the whole of contemporary education can be described as a process of encumbering the student's mind with as little knowledge as possible. The place for knowledge, it seems to believe, is in external sources, books and libraries, which the student knows how to use when necessary. The results of this type of education are visible in the hordes of students who, despite years of schooling, have learned virtually nothing, and who are least of all capable of thinking critically and solving problems. When such students read a newspaper, for example, they cannot read it in the light of a knowledge of history or economics. They do not know history or economics. History and economics are out there in the history and economics books, which they were taught they can look up if they need to. They cannot even read it in the light of elementary arithmetic, for they have no internally automated habits of doing arithmetic. Having little or no knowledge of the elementary facts of history and geography, they have no way even of relating one event to another in terms of time and place. <clears throat> such students, and of course the adults such students become, are chronically in the position in which to be able to use the knowledge they need to use, they would first have to go out and acquire it. Not only would they have to go and look up relevant facts, which they already should know, and now may have no way even of knowing that they should know, but they would first have to read and understand books dealing with abstract principles. And to understand those books, they would first have to read other such books, and so on. In short, they would first have to acquire the education they already should have had. Properly, by the time a student has completed a college education, 
his brain should hold the essential content of well over a hundred major books on mathematics, science, history, literature, and philosophy, and do so in a form that is well organized and integrated so that he can apply this internalized body of knowledge to his perception of everything in the world around him. He should be in a position to enlarge his knowledge of any subject and to express his thoughts on any subject clearly and logically, both verbally and in writing. Yet as the result of the miseducation provided today, it is now much more often the case that college students, college graduates, fulfill the romantic ideal of being, quote, simple, uneducated men. Contemporary education is responsible for the growing prevalence of irrational skepticism. The students subjected to it do not acquire actual knowledge. They have no firm foundation in a base of memorized fundamental facts, and they have not acquired any solid knowledge of principles because their education has avoided, as far as possible, the painstaking processes of logical proof and repeated application of principles, which latter constitutes a vital and totally legitimate form of memorization. <clears throat> Such students go through school by the seat of their pants. They are forever winging it, and that is how they go through life as adults. It is impossible for them to have genuine understanding of anything that is beyond the realm of their daily experience, and even of that, only on a superficial level. To such people, almost everything must appear as an arbitrary assertion taken on faith, for their education has made them unfit to understand how things are actually known. Their failure to memorize such things as the multiplication tables in their childhood makes it impossible for them to understand whatever directly depends on such knowledge, which in turn makes it impossible for them to acquire the further knowledge that depends on that knowledge, and so on. With each passing year of their education, they fall further behind. Ironically, their failure to memorize what it is appropriate to memorize ends up putting them in a position in which to pass examinations they have no other means than out-of-context memorization, memorization lacking any foundation of logical connection and proof. Because they have never memorized fundamental facts and thus have no basis for developing genuine understanding of all that depends on those facts, they are placed in a position in which to pass examinations they must attempt to memorize out-of-context conclusions. It is because of this that a growing proportion of what they learn as the years pass has the status in their minds of arbitrary assertions. They are chronically in the mental state of having no good reason for most or almost all of what they believe. Thus, in their context of actual ignorance masked by pretended knowledge, they are prime targets for irrational skepticism. To them, in their mental state, Doubt of everything can only seem perfectly natural. Such, student, such students, such adults, are easy targets for a doctrine such as environmentalism. They are totally unprepared intellectually to resist any irrational trend and more than willing to leap on the bandwagon of one that caters to their uncertainties and fears. Environmentalism does this by blaming the stresses of their life on the existence of an industrial society and holding out the prospect of an intellectually undemanding and thus seemingly stress-free pastoral existence, one which is allegedly in harmony with nature. The destructive work of contemporary education carried on against the development of the student's conceptual abilities from the earliest grades is compounded as their education advances to the higher grades by the teaching of the whole collection of irrationalist doctrines that I described in my pamphlet. Such doctrines, as I have said, constitute the philosophical substance of what now passes for a liberal arts education. They and the methodology of contemporary education have totally fouled the intellectual mainstream. The kind of education I have described, if it can still be called education, 
consisting as it does of an unremitting assault on the rational faculty and every rational value, is responsible for the hordes of graduates turned out over the last decades who have had no conception of the meaning or value of the Constitution and history of the United States or of the meaning and value of Western civilization itself. It has been responsible for the decline in the quality of government in the United States, as unavoidably many such miseducated graduates have found their way into the halls of Congress and the state legislatures and into major offices in all other branches of government. And of course, uh, into all the various branches of the news media and publishing. As I wrote in my article, Education and the Racist Road to Barbarism, I believe it has even been responsible for the widespread use of drugs inasmuch as living in the midst of modern civilization with a level of knowledge as meager as that imparted by contemporary education must be a source of chronic and profound anxiety urgently calling for relief. To many, drugs may seem to provide that relief. The intellectual mainstream has been at war with the surrounding capitalist society for over a century and a half. Today, the rise of environmentalism and of feminism and the new racism on university campuses and elsewhere makes clear that the intellectual mainstream is also at war with the wider intellectual tradition of Western civilization as well. Environmentalism denounces Western civilization for extolling man above nature. Feminism and the new racism denounce it as sexist and racist, the alleged product of white male genes. Contemporary education, despite the existence of numerous individual exceptions, is thus reduced in its essentials to the activities of a clutch of non-entities engaged in a two-front war with the surrounding material civilization of capitalism and with the intellectual heritage of all of Western civilization. Clearly, as Ayn Rand observed 30 years ago, the intellectuals are dead. These intellectuals are dead. <clears throat> And matters have now reached the point where the most urgent task confronting the Western world is to find replacements, new intellectuals, who, unlike the alleged intellectuals of today, will be committed to the value of human reason. Unless such intellectuals can be found and in sufficient number, the world coming into existence before our very eyes will be very much like the one H.G. Wells described in his famous story, the time machine. In Wells' story, set in the far future, the human race has divided into two degenerate branches, the hideous subterranean Morlocks, who feast on human flesh, and the pretty surface-dwelling Eloi, who in totally vacuous innocence serve as food for the Morlocks. It is sometimes difficult to believe, <coughs> to avoid believing, I'm sorry, to avoid believing that, figuratively speaking, as a result of irrationalist philosophy and its inculcation through contemporary education, these degenerate branches of the human race already exist in the form of the leaders of the environmental movement and those who offer it no resistance or even rush to join it, oblivious to the obvious destruction that awaits them. For it would seem that contemporary education has resulted in the creation both of monsters and of vast numbers of people so mentally enfeebled and so <coughs> deprived of even an elementary sense of manhood that they have no wish or capacity to resist the monsters. Almost every day, such people hear open calls for the radical curtailment of energy consumption, their energy consumption, <clears throat> and they do not react. They buy best-selling books by environmentalists and read such passages as, quote, the environmentally sane standard of living for a population our current size would probably be somewhere between that of the average Englishman and of the average Ethiopian. Each lives unreasonably. <clears throat> this appears in McKibben's The End of Nature. In other words, they read an open declaration by a leading environmentalist that if environmentalism has its way, their standard of living would be somewhere between poverty by American standards and outright famine. Again, they do not react. 
Of course, they do not even react against open calls for mass death. I believe that the reason the masses of people do not respond with outrage against environmentalism is partly the fact that their education has left them unable to take ideas seriously. They hear and read such pronouncements and have the reaction that, like so much of the nonsense they were taught in school, the pronouncements do not or cannot mean what they say. In addition, and even more important, their education, reinforced by the experience of growing up in a welfare state, has left many of them with a mentality similar to that of small children, who, lacking all knowledge of how wealth is actually created, sometimes appear to believe that it, quote, grows on trees. <clears throat> Thus, very many of our contemporaries, almost certainly the overwhelming majority of the rank and file of the environmental movement, believe that the availability of goods is automatic and indestructible, and that they have a corresponding automatic right to goods. For the most part, they have little or no knowledge of history, and even the very best educated among them have absolutely no real knowledge of economic theory. They simply have no conception of the process of creating wealth or what its requirements are. They have absolutely no concept of what a remarkable productive achievement the economic system of the present day industrial world actually is, and that it is capable of being destroyed. <clears throat> now they are not, of course, so totally incredibly ignorant as to believe that human beings all over the world live as people do in the United States or the other industrial countries, or even that in these countries people have always lived as they do now. And they certainly do not believe that everyone, even in the present day United States, lives well. But to the extent that they have any explanation of differences in the standard of living, it centers on the notion of a distribution of wealth. There are poor people in America and elsewhere in the world, they believe, because of social injustice. That is, because of an unfair distribution of wealth. And that is the basis on which they explain the lower standard of living of earlier periods, especially the 19th century. Thus, like small children, they believe, in effect, that automobiles, television sets, and everything else just grow on trees. Moreover, they believe that these trees, unlike the trees of nature, will always exist, no matter what is done to them, and that in the absence of social injustice, they will always be able to obtain from them all of the goods they now enjoy. <clears throat> On this basis, they feel free to support the delivery of one blow after another to the economic system. Ever more taxes, ever more regulations in the expectation that they themselves will never suffer as a result of such actions. All that will happen, they believe, is that they will succeed in shaking or prying loose some more goods from the wealth trees, or nowadays more and more, that they will succeed in putting an end to this or that irritant or annoyance. The only ones ever to suffer, they believe, if anyone ever actually suffers, are rich businessmen. All of this is an essential part of the intellectual environment in which the ecology movement has flourished. In this intellectual environment, it is perfectly possible for people to proceed as though, for example, the only connection between their lives and the existence of oil companies is that the oil companies contribute to the pollution of beaches or, with their pipelines, prevent the migration of one or another species of cute, precious animals. It is perfectly possible for them to carry such blindness to the level of economic activity as such and to believe that the only practical effect of economic activity is pollution and that in stopping economic activity, all they will stop is pollution. <clears throat> it is in this way that they are ripe for the remarkable conclusion I described in my pamphlet that the threatening forces of nature are created by us and that we could do better without our material means for dealing with nature than with them. They feel free to abandon industrial civilization in the unstated conviction that if and when it is abandoned, 
they will still be able to keep essentially all the goods they now enjoy, and in addition will have such benefits as cleaner air, the preservation of assorted cute animals, and the avoidance of such impending, alleged impending calamities as frighteningly bad weather. Nothing, they believe, will be required of them but some token loss, such as having to sort their garbage for recycling or to form carpools, which is not so bad, they feel, because it provides new bases for such good things as sharing and camaraderie. Thus, in what may prove to be the greatest tragedy in all of human existence, we see at the end of, two, of, of more than two centuries of man's most dazzling success, the proliferation of heirs who as adults possess less than the mentalities of children. We see a culture of reason and science being, being transformed before our very eyes into one which more and more resembles a culture of primitive man. Only the emergence of a large number of new intellectuals prepared to fight against environmentalism and irrationalism and for reason and capitalism can assure that 21st century man will be man in any sense worthy of the name. The popular acceptance of environmentalism is explainable in all of its aspects on the basis of the irrationalism inculcated by the contemporary educational system and the consequent cultural decline of the status of reason. To the environmentalists and the closely related supporters of animal rights, the possession of reason does not seem significant because they consider it unreliable. Indeed, they regard it as a trap and a snare and hate it. With man's distinctive attribute thus held to be unworthy of special valuation, man himself necessarily appears unworthy of special valuation. Thus, as the environmentalists see matters, they are advocates of a universal brotherhood of all species and all elements of the environment. In their eyes, there are, in effect, blacks, Caucasians, Orientals, giraffes, snail daughters, flies, spotted owls, and mountainsides, all with equal rights in the environmental family. The assertion of man's rights above those of any other species or inanimate object is, in their view, a form of racism and Nazism, of speciesism, <coughs> they have that term, in which man seeks to treat other parts of the brotherhood of nature as concentration camp inmates. This trend is directly and powerfully reinforced insofar as people are increasingly unaware that there ever was such a thing as the age of reason and what it stood for, and that there existed and still do exist philosophers of reason. <coughs> Furthermore, people <coughs> increasingly lack the intellectual capacity to acquire even the slightest understanding of what such thinkers have to say. For example, a book written in the 18th or 19th century is beyond the power of many or most of today's college students and recent graduates to read. They think of it as having been written in Old English. Worst of all, the introspective experience of the growing hordes of such miseducated people does not provide very powerful testimony on behalf of reason or the value of man, nor does their external behavior, which increasingly, which increasingly incorporates such practices as the use of narcotics. To someone who can barely read, let alone write or even speak coherently, despite years of schooling, a view of man as a heroic being, if comprehensible at all, must appear to be from another planet. Such people are intellectually far more at home with the animals of the forest than with the men of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. They fulfill to the letter the ideal of the Romantics. The environmentalists do not realize that apart from man, the allegedly beautiful and harmonious nature that they extol is in reality merely a place in which one thing eats another, alive. If man were nothing more than an animal, he would be entitled to act toward the rest of nature in exactly the same way as all other living things act, 
namely to use it for no other purpose than as a means of serving his own survival. But man's possession of reason elevates him above the rest of nature. By virtue of it, man has a range of knowledge and awareness incomparably surpassing that of every other species. And with the aid of the goods his, his, that his reason makes it possible for him to produce, he comes to surpass all other species in virtually every physical respect as well. Thus, with the aid of goods such as automobiles, airplanes, ships, and submarines, telescopes and microscopes, radio and radar, and bulldozers and steam shovels, he can outrace any animal, fly higher and faster than any bird, move, deeper, move, move in water deeper and faster than any fish, and see and hear further and in more detail and exert incomparably greater force than any other living being. The possession of reason not only elevates man above the rest of nature in the inherent conflict of species for survival, within the human race it also creates a harmony of rational self-interest by virtue of making all men potential cooperators in the division of labor and thereby enabling each to serve his own self-interest better by living in peace with his fellow men and enjoying the benefits of the exercise of their reason as well as his own. <clears throat> Thus, it is man's possession of reason that is the foundation for an objectively demonstrable brotherhood of men and for the respect that each human being should accord every other human being. It is man's possession of reason that is the only basis for the existence of the concept of rights. Rights are precisely the social conditions of existence rational beings require their fellow creatures to acknowledge for the sake of the proper survival of all. The essential such social condition, of course, is that others not initiate the use of physical force against the individual. Only on the basis of respect for individual rights can human beings reap the benefits of the operation of each other's motivated human intelligence. To put this another way, rights are fundamental utilitarian principles with human life and well-being serving as the standard for what constitutes utility. The only proper ethical standpoint is one which, on the basis of man's possession of reason, asserts the harmony of the self-interests of human beings and the absolute priority of human life and well-being over that of any lesser species. It is only in the name of the special value of man that individual rights can be upheld and such evils as racism and Nazism be opposed. When the environmentalists disregard the special status conferred on man by the possession of reason, they do not thereby elevate flies, snail daughters, and mountainsides to the level of man, but rather reduce man to the level of those things. <coughs> If man is regarded as no better than flies, that is how he will be treated. That is how he is treated in every irrational culture. Indeed, the doctrine of the environmentalists and the animal rights advocates implies nothing less than that a human being deserves to be killed for killing a fly, or for walking on grass, or for leaving his footprint in the sand. Each of these things flies, grass, and sand, is alleged by the environmentalists to have a right either to its life or to its pre-existing condition. <clears throat> if capital punishment is to be used to defend such an alleged right to life or pre-existing condition, then the conclusion follows inescapably that human beings are to be killed for such things as killing a fly. And what if capital punishment is not to be used? Are human beings then to be imprisoned or flogged for the violation of such alleged rights of flies, etc.? If they are not, is there then to be no punishment at all for the violation of such alleged rights? If the violation of such alleged rights is not to be punished, does that mean that there is also to be no punishment for the violation of human beings' right to life? In proclaiming an equality of species and of the environmental family, environmentalism is not merely mistaken, it reveals itself as psychopathic. 
In this light, one may wish to consider such statements as, quote, it is an intensely disturbing idea that man should not be the master of all, that other suffering might be just as important, and that individual suffering, animal or human, might be less important than the suffering of species, ecosystems, the planet, unquote. <clears throat> this passage is from McKibben's The End of Nature. Uh, the publisher, incidentally, is Random House. A person may find it difficult to distinguish such statements from the utterances of a psychopath who, in the process of torturing his victim, declares that the victim's suffering is, quote, less important than the suffering of species, ecosystems, the planet, unquote. <clears throat> a person may encounter similar difficulties in differentiating these words as well. Quote, to cap his argument, White, <clears throat> that's Lynn White, the leading environmentalist theologian, <clears throat> even dared to defend the rights of life forms undeniably hostile to his own species, like the smallpox virus variola. The implication was that a thoroughgoing Christian sense of morality must include smallpox, just as St. Francis included man-eating wolves. Perhaps White hoped for a Latter-day Saint who could instruct Variola in cosmic courtesy. <clears throat> More likely, he simply recognized that in killing people, the smallpox virus was only performing its appointed role in the ecosystem God created. This is from a book called Rights of Nature, published by the University of Wisconsin Press. Now, of course, <clears throat> such words could not possibly be the words of psychopaths. <clears throat> if they were, such prestigious publishers as Random House and the University of Wisconsin Press could not possibly have published them, could they? <clears throat> furthermore, <clears throat> furthermore, how could anyone object to the teachings of those who love so much that they love the enemies of man and love man fully as much as they love wastelands, ferocious beasts, and vermin. Contrary to the environmentalists, man and man alone introduces conscious purpose and the perception of order and harmony into the world and is the source of all value to himself. All of these concepts center entirely on his furtherance, fulfillment, and enjoyment of his life. Man and man alone is capable of having purposes and must have them if he is to live, since he can live only by means of thinking, planning, and acting on a long-range basis. The perception of order and harmony comes into the world as man comes to understand the world and how to use that understanding to serve his life. In the process of serving his life, man gives value to nature and to other species of life as serving his life. Always, he is the center and the source of all value and purpose and of the perception of order and harmony. Of course, the members of other species may be presumed to be of value to themselves in that they act to survive. However, insofar as their survival clashes with any human value, Conflict exists between them and man, and man m must, deserves to, prevail. The standard of man's values is man's life. All presumed other standards of value may safely be left to other forms of life to represent them as best they can. Regrettably, large numbers of our contemporaries apparently have so little self-esteem that it appears sufficient to them merely to assert the existence of any kind of will or value seeking that is contrary to their own, and they are prepared to abandon their own values. Thus, there are growing numbers of people who abstain from wearing furs or eating meat out of deference to the desire of lower animals to go on living. Such people value themselves and the enhancement of their own life below the lives of lower animals. They place their own value not only below that of the lower animals whose furs they might wear or whose flesh they might eat, but also below the value that lower animals attach to themselves. That is, they accord less value to themselves relative to lower animals than all the animals that hunt accord to themselves relative to other lower animals. A lion or leopard values himself above a zebra or gazelle. 
but the environmentalists and advocates of animal rights value themselves below cattle and sheep and as less worthy of enjoying cattle and sheep than lions and leopards. True enough, they might not quite put it this way. <laughs> what they would probably say is something along the lines that because man is higher than the animals, his behavior must be better than theirs. That, in effect, he must become their benevolent keeper. In other words, the human race is to become a kind of Mother Teresa to the lower animals. This is altruism at the very bottom of the pit. To be sure, in serving his own life, man may extend the hand of friendship to members of such species as cats and dogs, which in some ways resemble small children and which often respond to him with what can only be described as joy and love. Indeed, the love people feel for such friendly creatures may provide a basis for overcoming the growing lunacy of animal rights. Whoever loves a dog, for example, should think of his dog's pleasure in chewing on a steak bone <coughs> and ask himself if he does not, after all, value his dog's pleasure above the life of the cow that provided the steak bone. <coughs> and then he should ask if this is not perfectly right in view of the fact that the dog recognizes and responds to him, the man, <coughs> with love while the cow is little more than an object whose greatest contribution to human life and well-being is to serve as a source of milk, meat, and leather. Finally, he should ask himself if it is not also perfectly right that while his dog chews on the steak bone, he, the man, eats the steak itself because he values his own pleasure even more highly than that of his dog. The environmentalists and the uh, advocates of animal rights need to learn the value of man and of themselves as the possessors of reason. Perhaps if they were to acquire the education they thus far have apparently lacked, they would succeed in learning their own value. Man, rational man, not only is capable of creating an economic system which can produce an ever-rising standard of living, but, but precisely because he is rational, because he is man properly so-called, also deserves such an economic system and all the marvelous goods it can bring. It is in this spirit, as I say in my pamphlet, the 21st century should be the century in which man begins such great undertakings as the colonization of the solar system. It should not be a century in which he returns to the Dark Ages. I hope it will be the objective of everyone here to see that it is the former alternative which prevails. In closing, I want to say that I believe that the fight against environmentalism represents an enormous opportunity for the advancement of objectivism. It is an opportunity, in effect, to throw an objectivist philosophical tie line to the rationality of every intelligent person who can be reached on this issue. Whoever is capable of understanding the evil of environmentalism in philosophical terms is a candidate for becoming an objectivist, because it is clear that only objectivism is capable of providing the foundations of the philosophical case against environmentalism. Furthermore, as I indicate in my pamphlet, the fight against environmentalism should be a leading vehicle for introducing the writings of Ayn Rand and also of Ludwig von Mises into the educational curriculum. This should be the overriding goal of objectivists in the coming decades, their leading demand and the goal of all their other activities. To the degree that it is successful, it will be the launching pad for a rebirth of reason in our, in our culture and provide the foundation for the establishment of a fully capitalist society. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I know I overran my time, and I'm hoping that I can steal a little of extra time uh, to add to the question period. So, uh, Diane, could you please uh, help us in that to add at least 10 minutes to the question period? Uh, this gentleman right over here. Sir, Dr. Reisman, you said at the beginning of your talk that the Greens will fade more rapidly than the Reds sure. because they are more openly irrational. Yeah. You talked about an hour about how irrationality was growing. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I said I thought that environmentalism would fade from the scene more rapidly than the socialists, and uh, what can I suggest to accomplish this? That, in essence, I think is your question. Why am I so confident? Okay, I have to admit, in being so confident, that I am taking for granted that people possess some degree of rationality, and when uh, confronted with uh, irrefutable facts, will assent. Now, uh, you could probably make a case uh, if uh, they haven't changed very much in India in a, in a long, long time. I still don't think we're anywhere near that level. I think what can change it is uh, identifying the fundamental situation, being absolutely radical. The, uh, we should be damning openly at every opportunity with our arguments the entire intellectual establishment. <coughs> They don't know anything. They're openly attacking Western civilization. They're openly attacking capitalism. In the name of what should anyone listen to a thing they have to say? There is no basis. We should constantly be saying that they are uh, completely, totally wrong, that you cannot be an educated person in the modern world if you have not read the works of Ayn Rand, and also, I would add, von Mises, and have a sound general education. Uh, I, I'm sure this is not enough uh, for you to really go out and do too much with. The essential is each of us, to the maximum limit of our capacities, has to become a truly educated person. We have to know uh, not only philosophy as far as we can, but be genuinely educated. And I'm sure most of us are uh, fairly well educated. And we have to act as teachers and challenge uh, the entire uh, intellectual system, the entire mainstream. <clears throat> we have to establish the idea that the mainstream, the intellectual mainstream, is rotten and corrupt. <clears throat> and the facts, I think, are pretty obvious. The schools are not educating. <clears throat> the products, you think of the fact someone goes to school for 12, 16, or even more years, and what does he come out believing? He comes out believing there are two groups of students. I, I said it in uh, the opening night. There are those who think they're no better than animals, and there are those who can't answer these students. In this environment, I think all we have to do really is stand up, assert our arguments fully and openly, uh, learn them better, just go out there and, and be as individually articulate and aggressive as we can, and be confident that we're right, and sooner or later we're going to win. Let me add just one further thing. <clears throat> uh, this may sound a little too simple. <clears throat> Ultimately, we would have to win if simply the rate of growth in the number of objectivists is a little larger than the rate of growth in the general population. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> can, can we think of some way, could we think of some way to double the number of objectivists every 10 years. What could you do to increase the number of objectivists? Well, you have to get our ideas out into a wider audience. We have to be addressing issues on the foundation of our philosophy. We have to be making major statements on major issues from a clear philosophical perspective. I think I've done that with environmentalism and uh, the Western civilization issue. Try to do that on any issue you can, and let us send our ideas to people who are not immediately familiar with them, 
who might like what we're saying on this issue, recognize the perspective from which we speak, and then be prepared to pull them further in. If someone likes uh, uh, our critique uh, of socialized medicine or whatever, then we should try to pull them into our orbit, have a, a few books that you would then suggest such people read. Now, I would, the obvious first candidates in another few months will be the combination of Atlas Shrugged and uh, Dr. Peacock's book. You might think of what are a good five or six books for someone uh, to become interested in. And you want to then bring that person as a contributor. So I would think we're right. To whatever extent people have any grain of reason left, we ought to be able to grow. And I really don't think it's impossible. You know, I, I have the image of Apple computers starting in a garage and things of this kind. I can't see in principle why that sort of thing might not be duplicable. Uh, we have to be actively on the lookout, each of us, how could we expand the range of our ideas. We can't just keep talking to ourselves. Think of how you can make other people aware of our ideas. Sometimes just making them aware that such ideas exist. There are probably lots of people out there who have better ideas or better uh, emotions but who don't know that what they'd like to hear is even being said. And if they were just aware of it, like if they knew simply there's an opposition to environmentalism and it sounds reasonable, a handbill can help. Anything to make us better known. Yeah? As an organizer of a campus club and someone who has been involved in that kind of activity, I just wanted to add that those of you who are able to support the Ayn Rand Institute should give every penny that you can possibly afford to effectively to accomplish all of that. Well. <laughs> that certainly is one important way, yes. Uh, this gentleman, the lady, is it Ms. Katowski? I'm, no, I'm sorry. Okay, this is a very good question. The lady asks if I would comment on the consequences of the waste of capital required to conform with uh, environmental regulations. For example, environmentalists take it into their heads that the ordinary gas, underground gasoline storage tanks in gas stations may be unsafe, so they require that gas station owners dig them up and replace them with new tanks. Uh, they're about to require that the whole dry cleaning industry, in effect, buy back their businesses by investing uh, an amount of capital equal to what they've already invested to be in compliance with the new uh, air pollution controls. Like they invent some bizarre uh, anticipated danger, and they're prepared to force people to spend vast sums of money to comply. Now this uh, uh, can have very serious cumulative con uh, consequences because when you take the capital that already exists and you cause it to be wasted, you're not only making that capital unavailable for the production of consumer goods that we might have desired, you're also making capital less available for the production of further capital goods. And the consequence is, as a minimum, a lower rate of progress and if it goes far enough, it can be that we don't produce enough capital goods even to replace those we've got. Let me give you a, an example that I've used in previous uh, lectures uh, <clears throat> to illustrate the principle. Uh, think of the conditions of, a, of an isolated farmer. His capital consists of seed. His product is wheat. And he uses up the seed to grow the wheat, and he gets fresh seed as part of the wheat that he's grown. Part of the crop is the, his capital. That's the way it is in our economy. We're using up uh, steel mills, cement factories, raw materials. We have to keep replacing them out of the output we produce. Well, now, imagine we have a farmer, if the government leaves him alone, with one bushel of seed, he can grow four bushels of crops. Well, then this farmer 
only needs one bushel of seed to take out of his crop to replace the seed he's used up. He could consume the other three, or he could add to his capital. He might consume two and then have doubled the seed to uh, produce in the future. Well, now suppose the environmental movement steps in, and it requires that uh, out of the crop that he produces, he, use, he waste one bushel, he wastes one bushel for no good reason in dealing with uh, morbid fears. And now he's only got three. <clears throat> well, what does that do to the proportion of his output that is now required to re merely to replace the capital that he's used up? It used to be only one-fourth, now it's one-third. If he was only willing to devote one-fourth, and now he needs one-third to replace what has to happen to him. He'll decline. If it's not quite that serious, he certainly advances less. The effect of environmentalism is to undercut what I've referred to in a previous series as the productivity of capital goods. It reduces the ratio of output to the supply of capital goods, and this uh, powerfully undercuts uh, the chances for capital accumulation. Uh, Mr. Trusinski. Uh, could you comment on the uh, attitude of conservatives towards environmentalism commented on the, uh, the leftists? I was wondering about, the, about the conservatives and where they stand. Could I comment on the attitude of the conservatives toward environmentalism? I don't think I can give very much of a comment simply because I don't know enough. I assume that there are some conservatives who are fairly strongly against it and others not so. Uh, on, I was watching a congressional debate on C-SPAN, I think, and there at, uh, at the start of the um, Iraq war, or last summer when uh, Iraq had invaded Kuwait, and there were some good representatives who were openly saying uh, this is the result of the Sierra Club type policy coming home to roost and there were titters in the audience from most of the congressmen. There are uh, some conservative congressmen, I think, who are good, and there are others uh, who are probably very cowardly and mediocre. Uh, Professor Kirkpatrick. Uh, is there a difference between the concept of economic growth uh, as we commonly hear today and economic progress as you use it? Are there any differences between the concept of economic growth and the concept of economic progress? Yes, I think there are substantial differences, and uh, I believe that part of our difficulties uh, derive from the fact that for a period of years, the concept of economic growth was used as a synonym for economic progress. Now, growth is a concept that pertains to an individual living organism. An individual organism grows, it reaches maturity, then it dies. So that automatically suggests limits to the process. Growth is also capable of applying to negatives. You could have a tumor that is growing. <clears throat> now, so we have economic growth uh, suggesting an inherent limit to the process and also open to the possibility of being negative. In contrast, economic progress does not apply to individual organisms. <clears throat> it applies to human beings across an indefinitely long succession of generations. Economic progress rests on the fact that being rational, we can communicate all prior knowledge to the rising generation, which if it continues to be rational, can then add to the sum of knowledge. So we have the possibility for an indefinite continuance of the increase of knowledge, which is radically different than growth. There are no limits to progress. And also, the very idea of progress suggests, connotes movement in a, toward, toward a higher, better state. You could never say to someone, oh, you don't know, I'm, I'm getting rich too fast. <laughs> I'm getting good looking too fast. <laughs> but with growth, uh, you, you could have such a thing. Thank you for asking. Uh, this gentleman right here. All right, could I comment on uh, a movement toward, I don't know how you quite describe the technology. 
appropriate technologies, appropriate technologies. Well, you see, these alleged appropriate technologies are more expensive technologies. Uh, people uh, increasingly are being asked to adopt more expensive methods of doing things in order to appease the irrational fears of the environmentalists. And the effect is their productivity of labor is less, and as I tried to indicate a few moments ago, the process could be cumulative because we not only, you see, when something is more expensive, anything that is more expensive can be taken essentially as meaning it requires more human labor to accomplish the same result. And to the extent that we do that, we are producing less goods, including less capital goods, with the same labor. I think you could have an analogy to individuals. Imagine you had an extremely disturbed individual who is worried about germs. And he might install double windows in his home, have all kinds of humidifier equipment, and God knows what else. Maybe he'd want to live uh, in a clean room of the kind in which they make color TV tubes. Now, such a person we would recognize as crazy. And, uh, he would be going to enormous unnecessary expense to accomplish this. Now the environmentalists are attempting to create this condition on a cultural basis. They're trying to spread morbid fear of things that we do not need to be afraid of, and in the process they're putting us to a great deal of unnecessary expense. Uh, Mr. Coates. Oh, two more questions? Okay, Mr. Coates. Okay, you seem to have at least two separate questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, could our optimism be undercut by some sort of crisis uh, that would be the pretext for uh, controls? I, I don't think any crisis automatically produces any definite result. It depends how the people interpret the causes and the cure of the crisis. And the ultimate outcome is going to be determined by how many people hold sound ideas. Uh, <clears throat> let me add another reason for my long-run optimism, which I didn't state before. Uh, I have had, uh, I would say, 95% of the same basic ideas uh, since uh, I was uh, a very young adolescent. And <clears throat> I can remember when I was about 12 years old <clears throat> recognizing that uh, capitalism was not very popular. Not, to me, it seemed obvious that it was implied in the uh, Bill of Rights and Constitution of the United States, and I had assumed that everyone must be for this. And I spent my 12th year coming to the conclusion that virtually nobody was for it. <laughs> and, but within the time since then to now, there has been an enormous change. When I was 12 years old, uh, I, used, I went to summer camp. Uh, the counselors were college students, and they would almost all be saying that they're democratic socialists. <clears throat> and the impression was everyone who was educated, who knew anything, was looking forward to the bright new world of socialism. <clears throat> and for many years, I used to, uh, when I finally began to meet a few other people who were in favor of capitalism, I used to say, you could have all the advocates of capitalism fit into one small living room. But there has been enormous growth. And today, as I mentioned at a talk roughly a year ago at uh, SCOA, I do believe that even though we are extremely small in absolute numbers, we already possess a plurality of those people who take ideas seriously, who respect ideas seriously, there are more people who, 
have sincere conviction in objectivism than there are who have sincere conviction in uh, reasoned conviction uh, than there are who have it in communism or socialism or environmentalism. I'm not talking about uh, the number of advocates. I'm talking about people who believe that it is important to have some rational basis for what they're saying, who have a reasoned position. We already have a plurality of those with a reasoned position. This was not true when I was a child. When I was a child, the overwhelming majority of people with what appeared to be a reasoned position were socialists. Uh, if there is this much rate of improvement in the next 40 years as in the last 40 years, I think we have uh, a real chance. <laughs> I, I'll just uh, answer the second part of the question. I do not have uh, any real familiarity with the state of education outside the United States. In many ways, I'm sure it's better, uh, but I'd have to know a lot more about it. Now, uh, have we run out of time? Okay, well, thank you very much.